So I'm going to close out this block before we get to some pearls of wisdom from both Teddy Slongo and Mike Millis. Um, and my only disclosure for this last talk is that um, I'm a poor replacement for Ira Zoltz, who was the original speaker, but unfortunately had to decline at the last moment because of some family um, commitments. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about breast practice for labral tears, but it's going to be a slightly philosophic talk on the labrum. And I think the amount of attention that this small structure surrounding the acetabular rim has received in recent years, it really is quite remarkable. Perhaps MRI has only increased our awareness. These are two side-by-side -side images of hips with the corresponding MRI, which were read by our radiologists as discrete labral tears. Both of these had been treated for developmental dislocations. Um, the one on the left with a pavlic harness and the one on the right with an open reduction. Uh, but I wouldn't really consider these to be labral tears, yet they were read as such. And the family was very concerned because they're much more aware of this now. Uh, this dislocated hip came back with a report from radiology that said there was a complete absence of the labrum. And after we did a closed reduction, they read this as labral hypertrophy and a discrete labral tear in the same patient. They first said there was no labrum, then they said it was hypertrophied and had a discrete tear. So I'm sure you're all aware that the um, scientific output about the labrum has increased exponentially in recent years. And it's always interesting to go back and you can find one of the first mentions of the labrum in 1933. However, that paper actually refers to Drosophila melanogaster, the common fruit fly, whose genetic sequence makes it ideal for research. And the mouth organ of this ghastly looking creature has a semicircular structure, which is actually called the labrum. And although it has nothing to do with the labrum we're discussing today, I'd like you to keep in mind this paper from 1933. Um, references to the acetabular labrum have also grown exponentially, although they're not quite as extensive as the ones uh, looking at the fruit fly. The first one I can find was by a Scottish gentleman by the name of Ian Patterson, who in 1957 uh, mentioned treating a torn acetabular labrum by open operation and resection. And a couple of years later, Thomas Dameron in, in North Carolina reported this paper in the JBJS where he said it seemed to serve a useful purpose. And he felt that this strong structure had an important function and should be replaced if possible. Perhaps this is the genesis of the repair versus resect debate. Um, but the problem is I don't think we're necessarily comparing apples to oranges. And I don't think all labral tears can be considered the same especially in the setting of such a broad spectrum of pathology as we see in hip dysplasia. Perhaps we need a more dynamic approach. I have been recently incorporating ultrasound into my evaluation with a gamut of findings, which honestly, I don't quite know what they will mean. On the left, you see what I think is a normal labrum, which is um, homogenous. Then as you move towards the images on the right, you see the femoral head below and that structure just above it is the labrum. And the images on the right appear to be cystic changes and degenerative changes, which can be evaluated with real-time ultrasound, uh, especially with um, reproduction of the patient's symptoms. Now, ultimately, looking inside the joint is the best way to define labral pathology. And the anchor group were um, crucial in, in showing us this with a an arthroscopic classification of labral pathology. Uh, and you could make the argument that doing an isolated arthroscopic repair doesn't compromise outcomes, but that's probably not true. This paper from Boston evaluated patients who underwent a PAO after failed arthroscopy and showed that results were not as good when patients had a previous arthroscopy. So there might be something more to this. It isn't only the labrum. There are other intraarticular findings which are not uncommon. Um, ben Dome showed us this one with hypertrophy and fraying of the ligamentum teres, which some believe is a sign of micro instability. 
And in general, they have considered hypertrophy of the labrum to be consistently present in patients with dysplasia. But again, the anchor group led by Woody Sankar in this case showed us that in fact, the labrum can, ha can have a standard size. The devil here is in the details. Unfortunately, I don't think our imaging is of high enough fidelity and reliability to know that we're truly consistently talking about the same thing in these patients. So what to do in the setting of display general labral tear? As Ernie mentioned, the group at HSS published this and found comparable results in patients undergoing periacetabular osteotomy with and without an arthroscopic labral repair. So this isn't without logistical issues. It increases the operating time. And in most instances, it requires two surgeons, one to perform the arthroscopic part and one to perform the osteotomy. So it's not that easy to do. And in fact, most studies evaluating the impact of arthroscopic labral repair, including this paper from Japan, show that patients do not have a worse outcome without labral repair after performing a periacetabular osteotomy in the setting of dysplasia. If the bony deformity is corrected to a more normal anatomy, the results have been consistently good with this redirectional osteotomy. So of course, the gold standard for most studies in medicine is a randomized control trial. And I give full credit to the study, which Ernie also mentioned that Paul Bule is leading from the anchor group for undertaking an attempt at a randomized control trial. However, I have to say that I think the hypothesis is prematurely biased, stating that concomitant hip arthroscopy at the time of PAO will result in a clinically important improvement without any significant increase in cost is inherently flawed especially given the colossal variability amongst surgeons, technique, pathology, and as has been brought up multiple times, expectations. I think it's very unlikely that even amongst a group like this, we would reach a consensus for what should be done for this hip with relatively mild dysplasia and a small but discrete labral tear. And even if we did achieve that consensus, the outcome would be highly variable given the almost artisanal nature of this kind of surgery. So to go back to our friend Drosophila, research by so-called Drosophilids has actually yielded no less than six Nobel Prizes in medicine since 1933 when that first paper was published. I think it's highly unlikely that with our primitive orthopedic definitions and interventions, that we'll come anywhere close to this. And in closing, I think the evidence to date just is not strong enough to recommend routine repair of a labral tear in the setting of acetabular dysplasia. But I'd be interested to hear um, what others on this panel feel about this, uh, as I do have a bias since I do not perform arthroscopy and I see Ernie raising his hand. So Ernie, what's your thoughts on this? Well, part of it is, uh, part of the issue is um, the concept of a labral tear. I probably spend the first 10 or 10 minutes on every new consult uh, trying to explain that it is not a tear per se. It's either detached or it's irritated because a lot of people feel that they've been told something is torn, that of course it needs to be repaired. And the, so the terminology is one of the issues. Um, and then they often will come from sports medicine surgeons that say you need your labrum repaired. And so when they come to you, they're told they have a labral tear, but this thing called dysplasia. And so you're going to repair the dysplasia, but what about the tear? And so one of the things I've had hard times getting into the study is the expectations, because if they still have some residual pain, it's very common. What about the labrum? And wasn't it torn? Um, so I do think there's an issue. I, I don't think on our studies that it makes a significant difference whether you do a labral reattachment or not in the majority of patients. There's a few patients, though, where you go into the joint and the labrum is like a bucket handle or a very hypertrophic, irritated, unstable um, uh, labrum, and certainly you feel like that... It, that soft tissue, because the nerve endings are there for a lot of the anterior hip, and maybe stabilizing that will help the PAO in a certain group of patients. But I agree with you. I think it'll be a long time till we have the answer. And what, what I tell patients most of the time, I don't think it matters. 
Um, the only thing is they come in with a predetermined feeling that they have to have the, a torn thing repaired. And that really makes it uh, challenging. Yeah, I think, again, that's, that's crucial because I think when we see patients and the radiology report says this, then it almost forces you into a different decision. Um, but I think it's in the way it's being read. I would ask either of the Simons who are still uh, connected if they've ever seen a labral tear in um, infantile hip dysplasia. Perhaps Simon Thomas, I see you're still there. Yeah, I'm just trying to unmute. <laughs> um, not knowingly, no. Not to say I haven't been there. Um, Simon Thomas, are you still around? Yes. Can you not hear me? Yeah. Yes, I did just answer. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, I did hear you. Simon Kelly, are you there? Yeah, just here, just a little bit back. Sorry about that. Um, uh, no, I, have, I don't recall seeing uh, any labral tears in the setting that you have mentioned specifically. Because I, so to Ernie's point, I think this is important. I recently had a patient come in who was seven years old and um, the report from radiology was that, and the family was much more worried about the report of the labral tear, perhaps because of the amount of attention it's received than the dysplasia, which was clearly um, more of the issue. And I think Ernie is right. If you correct the dysplasia and don't do anything about what's been reported as a tear, then the family's expectations may be unrealistic. So I'm not sure we necessarily know um, what we need to define. Again, I think that, the, that the, this term of labral tear, which is very frequent, at least in our radiology reports, um, has to be refined. Don't you think, Pablo, it's a little bit like... Um... It's a little bit, little bit like meniscal tears. So if you show a, a bunch of adult radiologists pediatric knees, they'll call a lot of tears that, that aren't there. It's, it's a difference in vascularity. And it's probably the same, same issue here, isn't it? I'd be surprised if we were missing lots of infantile DDH labral tears. Yes, I would, I would agree with that. And again, I think that's why I just don't think we are good enough at um, reading our MRIs to truly characterize this and know that we're really talking about the same condition. 